One of the things I'm most thankful for in reading David Lexler's book is that he has finally given me a term for what type of reader I am. I am an insane reader. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today we're talking about David Letzler's The Cruft of Fiction. He's talking about what he calls mega novels and the science of paying attention. Now, there are three types of readers that this book uh, could possibly appeal to just based on the title and the synopsis alone. Uh, first, are going to be the people attracted to the bit of the subtitle that says the science of paying attention. Uh, these are going to be, you know, people uh, interested in in seeing that kind of blending of science and the humanities, and specifically, you know, what goes on in the brain, a uh, neurologic neurological study of reading, and so on. Uh, these people will probably walk away. Uh, unsatisfied. The scientific aspect of the book is just sort of glanced at. We get into uh, a little bit of the really popular and, and emerging uh, science of neuroplasticity or elasticity, it's sometimes called, but basically the, the thought that our brains can uh, be changed. We can carve new neural pathways, and um, this has been really popular in self-help books uh, and things like that where you know, people can go back and sort of like an etch-a-sketch uh, shake and then retrace over aber aberrations uh, in our minds or and so on, which there is a lot of truth to that, although I don't think it's as immediate as a lot of these uh, people talk about. But he doesn't get so much, Letzler doesn't get so much into neuroplasticity and the elasticity of mind and so on. Um, he's getting a little bit at consciousness and he does get a little bit into uh, you know, the locations of the brain that light up when we read or when we fight to pay attention or when we lose attention and so on. But it's very, very minor. It's introduced early on for uh, consciousness. Uh, he basically takes from Antonio Damasio um, the feeling of what it's like in a couple of his other books and then uh, and Daniel Dennett and his theories final uh, of the multiple drafts theory. But the other people that it will uh, more likely appeal to are those who love mega novels, who love big books, such as myself, and then those who um, can't really connect with them, don't see what the fuss is all about, or otherwise uh, don't really like them. I think that it equally balances material for both. Uh, Letzler has really, really done his homework. He is an independent scholar or on his Queen's College website, it, he, he puts that he's a, an independent scholar, and then parenthetically it says that we should read that as an ex-academic. Uh, but he really deeply engages with his topic, and his secondary material is really remarkable and outstanding. This is a stunning work of scholarship. Uh, it, it seems that in, in these topics uh, that he's dealing with, he has left no stone unturned. There's a bibliography and then, of course, end notes. Very sumptuous and all the major players are included. You'll have Franco Moretti and Tom LeClaire, uh, Brian McHale and uh, Jameson, Stephen Moore. He balances, again, the detractors and the proponents. And so you get, he, he is really good about putting all the major theoretical and critical arguments on display. Uh, sometimes this can obscure what Letzler himself thinks. Uh, half the time I found myself wondering if Letzler uh, actually hates mega novels, but then another part of the time it seems that he loves them. Uh, and in fact, he ends the book uh, with Gravity's Rainbow, which he calls the greatest of all mega novels. So it does seem that he likes them. You would about have to to engage in a study like this. So thorough is he with his argumentation uh, that as my own mind was forming uh, counter arguments as I was reading the text, you know, my mind can't help but be like, oh, but what about blah, blah, what about blah, blah, blah. And almost every rejoinder that would crop up in my mind, it would just be a few pages later that he would uh, face that, that exact uh, thought. Essentially, what he wants to do here is he's using the term cruft, which comes from computer programming. It means sort of like junk code. It works, um, but it's clunky code. Um, it, it needs to be 
uh, refactored, and he is using it to talk about passages that for Letzler uh, in mega novels, these passages that are inconsequential to the plot as he deems it, or just otherwise superfluous. Uh, but he's not just trying to point out uh, how pointless they are or how it junks up the text or whatever. He is actually trying to uh, describe a teleology of Cruft. So Letzler is casting Cruft uh, as, as a useful function. And for him, uh, it's, he's making the argument that it helps us in day-to-day -day life when we're just bombarded with loads of information. It teaches us how to modulate our attentional capacities in a better way. I, I can't disagree at all with that. However, uh, there are times when he talks about how, you know, the whole purpose of Cruft in these mega novels is to teach us how to read or how to approach mega novels and learn what to skip and what not. That argument I do find a little bit tenuous because with each new novel, you're not going to know what is and is not Cruft because it's a new novel. Um, and as he himself points out, there's buried gold and buried uh, plot treasure and so on, even within uh, what can look like Cruft. So I don't think that uh, approaching it, approaching reading with this method is going to change the way we read, though I certainly agree and have for a long time that reading long, exhaustive novels uh, does teach us how to uh, approach this life in the information age um, with more discretion, discernment, and balance. Again, for those who were hoping for more of the scientific aspect of paying attention while reading, uh, I recommend Norman Holland's Literature and the Brain. This may be a little bit dated. I read it uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago, and, uh, but he does get way more into you know, what exactly is going on in the brain. Uh, this is like a, a neuropsychoanalytical study of readers and reading. We get a great range of mega novels in here, um, and the way that Letzler approaches it, he sort of appropriates or takes a cue from Northrop Fry in The Anatomy of Criticism, where he kind of gives them these templates. And in the same way, we get what Letzler calls the dictionary, and this includes J.R., The Making of the Americans, and Finnegan's Wake. The Encyclopedia, which is Moby Dick, Bouvard et Pécuchet, House of Leaves, Europe Central and Infinite Jest. So I'm very excited to see uh, William T. Volman make the cut. Life Writing or The Diary, which includes The Golden Notebook and The Pilgrimage, which I'd never heard of The Pilgrimage. It's this 13 volume uh, by Dorothy Richardson. Um, it has a lot of affinities with Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebook. Uh, these are the only two, sadly, uh, of the books that I haven't read. Oh, and perhaps Public Burning. All the others that he brings up I've read, but the funny thing is, uh, the type of reader that I am, again, now I know I'm an insane reader, that comes from uh, his statement about one of the collage pages in uh, Mark Z. Danielewski's House of Leaves, where it's all his you know, research material on top of the desk, it's all assembled. Uh, he said no sane reader would really process this stuff. So, you know, extrapolating from that, I'm an insane reader. The Manipian Satire, which for a while... Uh, early on in the book, uh, I was having trouble grappling with some of the things he was asserting um, because it was almost like he couldn't, he couldn't connect with the humor that's inherent in including some of what he calls cruft. For example, some of the footnotes, uh, especially in the Incandenza filmography footnote of Infinite Just, uh, where it's this like eight-page filmography uh, and reading that, it, it's, it's funny. And there are a couple of sections where it just says like untitled, unfinished, unreleased. And that happens a few times. And, you know, this is seen as pure cruft by Letzler. But at the same time, I'm like, you know, this is, that's funny. That's part of the gag. Just because it doesn't directly drive the plot or the story, you know, for it to be treated as cruft, uh, I was uh, ambivalent. But then in the Manipian satire, uh, chapter, which uh, uses the sotweed factor, the public burning, and the recognitions, then he did take on the role of humor. And while I still wasn't 100% convinced, um, again, this is a place where you can see Letzler as, as a, a very respectable scholar uh, who's taking on all the possible counter arguments. And then it ends with the epic and the allegory, which takes on Underworld, the Windup Bird Chronicle, 
which I thought was really odd in here, Midnight's Children uh, and Gravity's Rainbow. So uh, a lot of the books, you know, you see from others like Tom LeClaire, The Art of Excess, um, but then he drops in uh, some of his own and uh, that you don't see in others, such as Wind Up Bird Chronicle and Midnight's Children, which I thought was really refreshing. It is great to have this book because uh, as can be seen, there are people who go crazy for these books and people who uh, just recoil at them. And as the very first thing we read in here is, why do we respond so strangely to big books? And he's getting at those two camps where there's an agony and an ecstasy. And as he says, books that inspire fanatical devotion and revulsion in equal parts. So it is amazing uh, that he's able to so objectively and in a balanced fashion take on this material and the in this topic while you know incorporating everything from both camps putting everything on display while also having his own thesis in there it's really an extraordinary display of scholarship another thing that i do feel like he could have taken on in addition to uh, there's not a lot about rereading because a lot of the uh, a lot of these mega novels are made to be reread as william gas says you know uh, the first reading only prepares us uh, to reread it or, or prepares us to read the book as if for the first time. And as Nabokov says, uh, there's no such thing as reading, but only rereading. And these books, these mega novels especially, are made to be able to be read again and again and again. If you don't catch certain things because they're so buried, you know, that's because that, that's done on purpose uh, and ensures future reads instead of a book that's, you know, so concise and so proper uh, and so plot and or character driven um, that all the fat is shorn. Um, and it really ensures, you know, a limited lifespan, sort of like, you know, a stick of gum. Chicklets, as, uh, as Jonathan Franzen uh, famously referred to uh, downloadable uh, songs. Another thing is that he, Letzler doesn't bring up, or, or at least that I remember, doesn't really entertain the notion that it's, it's not so much that these books, like J.R., for example, uh, it's not so much that they're violating all the rules and, you know, that we need this uh, in order to be able to read books, that they have to adhere to certain things. Um, but some of these books are seemingly inventing their own rules. They're inventing their own rules and playing by them at the same time. Rules for reading, that is. When talking about stream of consciousness novels, he does say, but much as there is no scientific consensus as to what constitutes consciousness, there is no literary consensus as to how to write it. And so oftentimes what we're seeing is, again, there's no real consensus on how some of the stuff is to be written. Uh, and so we're getting the joy as readers of seeing someone come up with those rules at the same time as writing them. He talks about, in the Manipian satire chapter, he does talk about how difficult it is to really get uh, at a definition of humor, but he does a good job by saying, we consider something funny when we are primed for certain cognitive processes by one social schema, but then suddenly see those expectations violated. And that happens a lot in the footnotes of Infinite Jest. And that, to me, I find that very funny. And it doesn't necessarily have to be you know, completely tied to the plot. For Letzler... Uh, he's not so sure about that. He says the incongruity, such as those footnotes, for example, might provoke laughter, but mostly an unfocused, disoriented kind deriving more from the termination of processing than its continuation. Uh, and that agrees with stuff that James uh, Wood has said uh, against uh, Thomas Pynchon, which is also brought up in here, you know, about that some of these little gags and episodes and so on um, they really just detract from the plot. Um, but in my opinion, that is a little bit insulting to readers because I think that readers are actually more intelligent and have more of a capacity, more of a uh, memory and capacity for balancing the two, uh, you know, for being able to read the plot thread and then take a second to laugh at this and then come back. I think it's insulting to, to think that people can't deal with that. Now, some people, it may frustrate some people because, you know, they uh, prefer their fiction in a different way. And that's totally all right because, hey, in the end, there's plenty of fiction for all types of readers. Letzler can be very deadpan and actually comes off quite hilarious. If you do not like the recognitions, 
uh, and especially the middle portion, you will certainly found it, find an ally in Letzler who just says, what should we do, though, about the long stretches of purely stupid dialogue? In another deadpan moment, he says, as with all fortune telling, tarot is based in a highly figurative system that promises its subjects access via apparently unrelated signs to a larger pat pattern. And he's talking about the, the uh, place of tarot in Gravity's Rainbow. But then he says, also, as with all fortune telling, it is utter nonsense. He brings up, uh, like I was saying, he brings up Wood and uh, you know, James Wood talking about uh, the two clocks having a conversation in Pinchon's Mason and Dixon saying um, that this dilutes rather than increases the narrative's rich richness. But I, I uh, really disagree with that. The, uh, that episode of the two clocks having a conversation in Mason and Dixon uh, is extremely rich in literary value. He talks about how for Wood, these episodes, these interpolated episodes are pure cruft. Uh, and when I read that, you know, I immediately thought, but man, interpol interpolated tales uh, within larger stories have a rich history from Arabian Nights to Boccaccio to Cervantes. Uh, but then two pages later, that's exactly what Lexler starts digging into. So again, bravo. Gravity's Rainbow, he opens up uh, with a great hook. He says that it has that rare property shared by only the greatest books. It turns us all into hypocrites. Now that has our attention to read on. It does so by vacillating so rapidly between profound allegory and absurd conspiracy theory that it reveals how frighteningly inadequate are our cognitive apparatuses for distinguishing the two. And then the, the whole... The whole discussion on Gravity's Rainbow is excellent. And then, like I said, um, he ends it by saying that it is the greatest of all mega novels. So in the end, Letzler, it does seem that he, he loves these novels, uh, maybe a love-hate relationship. He loves them while also grappling with trying to figure out a use for some of this uh, cruft. Um, and he has attempted to find a teleology, a use, a function, a means to an end for reading through this cruft. At the very least, whether you read it to engage with its arguments or you read it just to, to see what the latest in the arguments around big books is, one thing that any reader will get out of it is a great discussion of each of the books. In fact, you can even uh, just put aside the thesis of Letzler's book and just enjoy his discussion of each of these novels, whether you've read them or not. I would argue uh, that you have read them uh, first because he does give away uh, some things in his discussion uh, of these books that you'll probably want to discover on your own as part of the joy of reading it. But each section uh, is a great treatment of the book in which it's discussing. Uh, and I found that it thoroughly enriched my own knowledge of those books, uh, while at the same time making me want to reread all of them over again or for the first time. This is from University of Nebraska Press, David Letzler, The Cruft of Fiction, Mega Novels, and the Science of Paying Attention. I hope you'll check it out and let me know what you think.